Good afternoon. If everyone could take their seats, we will be starting in, in just a moment. I'm just giving it an extra minute since we are following lunch and I know that I like to make sure that everything on the table is uh, taken advantage of before I leave. Which is why I was at the gym this morning running. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to join us on what is uh, the last day of at least these breakout sessions, uh, last se session before the uh, early afternoon and before hopefully some of us leave for the day. But you are uh, joining us for incentivizing compatible use, strategies and incentive to address land use conflict. Uh, which is a mouthful, but I think one of the most important sessions that you will hopefully attend while you're here in Nashville. Uh, at yesterday's session, uh, which was in this room at the same time, uh, community responses to the demands of military mission growth, uh, for those of you in the room, there were three speakers who spoke about how they are responding to growth at their installations in response to bro uh, Grow the Force and BRAC actions. Uh, one of those communities around San Antonio actually has a joint land use study. Uh, what I thought was quite uh, poignant was the last question of that session uh, focused on addressing to the speakers, um, how did you address the challenges and roadblocks to implementing the recommendations of the joint land use study? particularly because uh, several of those joint land use studies had sat on the shelf, uh, one actually done in 1995, and it had never actually followed through. Uh, we are fortunate today to have three communities who have actually addressed those roadblocks and have some great stories to tell in successes which they will share with you. Uh, two of them uh, have been working with OEA since 1999. And I think that shows uh, both the commitment of OEA to working with communities, but how addressing these roadblocks and moving forward with both partnerships, education, and persistence really can lead to some great stories. Uh, our, our first speaker, David McKeon, uh, who is with the uh, Ocean County as Director of Planning, uh, he is a licensed professional planner in New Jersey and, and a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. He graduated from Rutgers University in 1985 with a BS degree in environmental planning and design. David is going to be talking to you about his work around Fort Dix, Lakehurst, McIntyre. Uh, they completed their joint land use study back in 2009 and are a at the beginning of that process in addressing those roadblocks. But I think David has some good lessons to share with you about how to move forward in both a fiscally constrained environment where the planning department in one of the uh, participa participating counties has closed, as well as moving in an environment facing reorganization within the department itself with the uh, formation of a joint base in that area. So if you can Help me welcoming David. Well, uh, thank you, Amber, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming out today. My name, again, is Dave McKeon with, with Ocean County, New Jersey. We're one of the two counties that worked on the, the joint land use study uh, for McGuire, Dix, and Lakehurst. Um, Ed Fox from Burlington County is, is over here as well, as well as Tony Agliata from my office. 
Um, and what I'm going to focus on is uh, are some of the uh, post JLUS um, activities, implementation activities that uh, that we've started. Uh, some of the things that we are uh, doing now with the Joint Base, uh, working closely on several projects, uh, planning for the future, trying to mitigate future impacts that we know are coming down the road, um, and again, doing things much differently now than, than we used to do uh, five or six years ago. So, um, as Amber said, our joint land use report was completed in April of 2009, involving the two counties, uh, ten municipalities, uh, and a regional planning organization known as the Pinelands Commission in New Jersey, which has very strong zoning authority. So we felt it was important to have those uh, that uh, organization on the policy committee, as well as several uh, state organizations that we worked uh, with, uh, and the and the military base. What made our study fairly unique is that we, when we started our process in about 2007, we were dealing with three separate military installations. McGuire Air Force Base, uh, run by the Air Force, uh, Fort Dix, uh, Army, and Lakehurst Naval Air and, uh, Engineering Station, uh, a naval installation. These bases were contiguous with each other, but they all had their separate missions. Um, we are now, uh, as we completed the process, under one base. It's under the Air Force, under Colonel John Wood, um, on a facility that spans 42,000 acres. Uh, as a result of that action, uh, it not only consolidated the military operations, it also brought communities together that had never really talked uh, too much with each other through w regarding base issues. There were municipalities next to McGuire Air Force Base, they dealt with McGuire. There were municipalities next to Fort Dix, they dealt with Fort Dix, and so on. Now we were dealing with one joint base and, and we're starting to talk to, to one another. Just for a, a, a regional perspective, uh, this is the joint base here in pink. You can see it's centrally located in New Jersey near um, New York City, Philadelphia. This label is actually a little wrong. That should be down about here for Philadelphia and Atlantic City. Um, as many of you probably know, New Jersey is fairly developed, um, and, um, but it's not as developed in, in some areas as people think. And whoops, go back. Um, the central area of New Jersey is uh, fairly rural, uh, a lot of pine forests. I mentioned the Pinelands Commission. It's there really to protect that resource. Um, that's good and bad. Good because it's helped minimize encroachments to base operations. Bad because there are uh, a number of environmental regulations and restrictions that go along with that and make trying to do anything in the area fairly difficult. Um, Amber, I kind of I jumped to a F5. I'll catch up here. By the way, um, those are the municipalities down here below that, that are involved in the study, uh, the two counties and the joint base. Okay. Um, this is a closer look, an aerial view of the study area. The three bases that had been separated, uh, Lakehurst to the east, Fort Dix in the center, McGuire Air Force Base. Um, again, fairly rural, immediately adjacent in the so southern areas and, and up in this section. A lot of old established towns that uh, historically were tied to the bases are also dotted around the facility. And there's a lot of development pressure coming over here from the east. You can see a, a, a large development down there. Um, so we have a little bit of everything uh, in the area. When we completed our joint land use study in 2009, we had all of the policy members sign a memorandum of understanding, uh, really agreeing to continue to work to, to, uh, with each other. Uh, they now refer to themselves as the Policy Implementation Committee, um, agreeing to meet regularly, um, work with each other on implementation items, and, and basically uh, show a good faith effort to implement the recommendations of the report. Uh, shortly after that, we talked to OEA again and said, we're ready to move on several of the implementation items that were recommended uh, in the report, and if you can assist us, we'd, we'd really appreciate it. And, and they did. They came forward with a grant that let us do those four things that, that are on the, um, 
on the screen, and, and I'll talk a little bit about those now. The communication manual um, addresses something that was probably the number one complaint we heard in the beginning and sort of in the middle of our, of our JLIS process, and that is that the communication between the communities and the base were, was very poor. Um, the mayors, um, in particular, were very frustrated. Um, they were very quick to come out up front and say they support the military operation 100%. They wouldn't want to see it leave, but they're not being notified of training events or, or changes in schedules or uh, live fire artillery or things that are affecting the communities and the residents, instead of calling the base, we're calling the mayor's office. The mayor says, I don't know what they're doing. You, you get the, the gist of that. Um, and there was just a general level of frustration. Um, and one of the problems, of course, is base commanders change on a regular basis. And you may establish a relationship with one base commander, that commander leaves, another one comes in from across the country, you've sort of lost that continuity, that commander may do things differently than the previous commander. Um, so there was some frustration there. Base officials rightly pointed the finger back and said, you know, we used to deal very closely with your town. The previous mayor lost the election. A new person came in, changed all his planning consultants, and our relationship was gone. So it was a two-way street. And the manual was really meant to address some of those issues that I, that I just spoke of um, and, um, and provide information to, to both sides. It would identify key contacts on the military installation, what the responsibilities were, how you get a hold of them. Um, and on the other side of the fence, it would identify the local officials, um, who they were, and not just the mayors, but some of the, the people within the local governments that you might want to get a hold of. Um, so that, that's all there. Uh, the other important thing is the manual contains information on New Jersey planning and zoning uh, regulations. As we all know from, from the conference over the last couple of days, things are different in different parts of the country. Um, and in New Jersey, we do not have any unincorporated areas. They are all um, legal municipalities. They all have zoning authority. Counties do not have zoning authority. Um, a lot of people won't know that, and a new base commander coming in or some new people coming in wouldn't know that. And, and that's in the communication manual. It explains, you know, a little bit about how New Jersey works and some of the regulations that are in place. Uh, the question there, what is a freeholder? Um, if you're a new base commander and you've been on the job a couple of days and your aide comes in and says, um, there's a freeholder, Kelly, on the phone, he'd like to talk to you. And you'd probably stare blankly and say, well, what, what is or who is freeholder Kelly? Well, in New Jersey, it's the only state that uses the term freeholder for a county commissioner. Um, it basically, it's an old English term. It's been left over from pre-colonial days, but county commissioners are referred to as freeholders. Um, and in our case, we have a strong freeholder government, they call it. So a freeholder is a fairly powerful person, or is actually the top uh, county person. So he's somebody that the base commander would want to get to know and he'd want to want to talk to. The other study that we um, embarked on, we were ready to move on, was a transportation um, study. We wanted to look at what we knew were current impacts of base operations on the surrounding road network intersections and, com and capacity constraints, um, and look at, out in the future uh, at projected mission growth, what that would mean to, to traffic, what that would mean to people coming on the base and commuting back and forth, and also background growth in the, in the surrounding towns. What would they do in the future, and how would all of this growth impact the roads? Um, and so what we did was commission a study around, basically around a five-mile area of joint base, uh, looked at those intersections, looked at areas that we knew were problems now, um, and looked at areas that would basically go over into critical um, within the next um, 20 years or so. So um, a couple of slides here, that nothing really here other than to show you some of the information we put in there. We, we looked at current crash um, data, um, all these little dots are areas of high incidence of crashes, shows you basically where the roads are, need improvement right now. We did a origin and destination study for people working on the base, what road networks they use around there uh, to show what the high, highly traveled routes were uh, from the base. And the other important thing when we did this study is we had to look for the future for how we were going to fund these improvements. I mean, it's one thing to do the study and say the Department of Defense commissioned this and the study is done and state of New Jersey and Federal Highway Authority, you have to fund these projects. I mean, as all of you probably know, it, it doesn't work that easily. You, there's a certain procedure you have to go through under capital improvement programs to get your projects funded. 
and we were very careful in the beginning to talk to those agencies, uh, heavy involvement from our county engineering department, our state DOT, and New Jersey also has um, two metropolitan planning areas, one orientated towards New York, one towards Philadelphia. They actually split right down the middle of the base, so we had to involve both of those organizations, use a, an appropriate traffic modeling uh, program that was acceptable to both, um, so that when we're done the study and come up with the recommendations, we are very well suited uh, to put those in uh, for, uh, for funding, uh, funding improvements. Uh, the other big study that we're doing is a wastewater growth and a grace growth management plan. Um, we had um, a couple of municipalities on the northern end of Joint Base, fairly rural, but have towns that are very old, going back a couple hundred years. Those towns are on septics and cesspools. They're, they are not working very well. They really need an upgraded sewer system. Um, and so the base, uh, I should say, the OEA agreed to have us look at with the, work with those communities and see um, what type of solutions may be available, including a partnership with the base itself to use their on-site treatment facilities. Uh, one of the initial questions we got is, why would the military even want to get involved in this? And when the issue came up five years ago, it was a flat, no, we're not interested. Well, things change, and there is a need to work closer between bases and communities. Um, and that's one reason. A probably more important reason is the fact that with the base's involvement in this, they would be able to determine where any future growth would go. Uh, number one, the sewers address a current problem, but there would also be some growth that would occur as a result of the new sewers. The base would be able to say, okay, we're happy with the growth going this way, but not under the flight path, and the remaining part of the municipality will be downzoned to protect encroachment, um, protect from encroachment in the future. Uh, phase one of the study is underway right now. We're, we're finalizing that uh, for September. Phase two and phase three will basically look at the preferred alternatives, um, do some cost analyses, um, and then get into permitting and um, final design. This is just one example um, from the, re the draft report. This is one of the towns that is having um, problems with their, their wastewater treatment, septics, and so on. Another town is right here. Here's McGuire Air Force Base and the treatment facilities here. This just shows a hypothetical uh, force main line directly from the center of that town through the next town and into the treatment facility. So that's just a, a one example out of many alternatives that are being looked at. Uh, the last thing that um, was done was a, um, uh, or is being done, is an upgrade to the website that we did for our JLU study, providing information to the public, elected officials, and so on. Uh, we wanted to um, advance that to help with our land acquisition program. Um, we've done many partnerships with the military under the REPI program, um, buying land, protecting um, the, the base buffers, and so on. Um, and what we wanted to do was upgrade that to allow the many, many land acquisition organizations that are around, some national like the Trust for Public Land or Nature Conservancy, some local municipalities, counties, state of New Jersey, everyone that has a land acquisition program to be able to tie into this and coordinate their efforts. There will be a semi-secure section there where you would need uh, permission to access. That would have more confidential information on which landowners were con uh, contacted or appraisals underway. Is there a cost estimate? Is there funding necessary? So on. And it really assists in the effort of, of buying up some of the properties um, that are important. Uh, a couple of slides left. Um, this shows um, land acquisition to date. Um, most of this has, was acquired previous to our partnership with the base. The uh, dark brown areas are state forests, state um, fish and wildlife areas. Yellow areas are farms that have been preserved, farmland preservation program. Uh, the greens are some, um, some other direct open space acquisitions. Uh, these red areas are the ones that were, um, we have already acquired with the military. Um, most of those with a 50-50 partnership. In some cases, there's a 33-33-33 when we have another organization involved. But you can see the extent of the properties that we have been working with on the base within this, um, this buffer area. 27 properties to date, over 2,100 acres, uh, and we're still going. Uh, when we had completed our joint land use study, we did an analysis of encroachment areas, areas that we were very concerned about. This shows the accident potential zones on the McGuire side and the Lakehurst side. This property popped up as the top threat 
future threat, encroachment threat, for, um, for the joint base operation uh, within both accident potential zones one and two. Um, it's an 1,800-acre sand and gravel mine operation, which in itself is not a threat, um, but if ever that goes over for, um, for residential development, it is a big encroachment threat. So um, we finally, through the Trust for Public Land, again, were able to negotiate a deal with the uh, owner of this property that did several things, and two main things that both in themselves are very important to us. One was the northern part of this sand and gravel operation had not been mined, was wooded, had several lakes, uh, tributaries of streams, was adjacent to a, a county park, as well as a county natural lands area over this side that was previously acquired. This was 400 acres. It allowed us to basically fill in the connection between this county park and extend it from, I believe it's about 220 acres now. Ultimately, this will be one county park of 1,000 acres. So that one purchase allowed us to improve our county park system. The larger acquisition of 1,400 acres was a restrictive easement that only restricted future residential development. It did not um, prohibit the mining operation. That, that operation will continue for the foreseeable future. It also did not preclude any other form of development that may be compatible with military operations and may actually um, support military operations. And we were careful about this too. Um, we're not really talking about economic development today, but one of the things that's been important to us and been important to Burlington County is working with the base and, and supporting operations where possible, helping our local economy, bringing jobs in, um, and bringing fairly high quality jobs. Uh, Lakehurst does a lot of research and development, engineering, um, and we were basically looking for a place that could site a future um, corporate park or research development park to support operations in the future. Wouldn't be located directly under the runway, but again, it's a huge piece of property with opportunities over here to do those things. So multiple benefits from, from this as well. Um, so these are just a few examples of, of what we've been doing. Uh, we're early in the implementation process. Uh, we're winding down several projects now. We hope to start new ones next year uh, to continue to implement our plan. But communication has been very, very important. Probably the number one thing um, that we had to do that has been done, uh, working very closely now with the base officials in the communities. And uh, as long as we do that, um, I think we'll be in good shape. Thanks. Uh, we are going to hold all questions until the end, but as you listen to each of the presenters, I ask you to think about the challenges you're facing, if they parallel or relate to what you're hearing the speakers here talk about. And during uh, our, our question and answer period, I hope that you will bring those up to not only the speakers, but the audience as well. Um, you know, unlike New Jersey, not all localities and municipalities have a strong history of land use control or zoning. Um, I think that provides, obviously, challenges, particularly in such a fiscally constrained and weak economy, where often when you're asked to undertake a lot of these zoning types of recommendations, you often hear local policymakers and the public as well express concern that they may limit growth, they may prevent businesses from coming to the county and community. And how do you work over time to educate your counterparts and how do you work to ensure that there's a message and practicality on the ground that these joint land use recommendation, recommendations and implementation not only meet the mission of protecting the sustainability of the base, but as well as ensuring the economic vitality and sustainability of the community as well. Uh, we are fortunate to have Jim Freeman with us from the city of Havelock. He serves as the city manager there, and I have been actually fortunate since my time with OEA to be working with Havelock and um, Jim, and then the next speaker, Jenny Kozak, on the implementation of their projects. Um, Jim, uh, in addition to serving as Havelock City Manager, is an active North Carolina City and County Manager Association member. 
In addition, he also has 25 years of municipal experience as city manager of Roxborough in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and as a planner for Valdez, North Carolina. He received his North Carolina regional manager recognitions from both Region N and Region K Council of Governments. Uh, his education consists of a BA and MA degrees from Appalachian State University along with the North Carolina School of Government, Municipal Government, I'm sorry, along with the North Carolina School of Government, Municipal Government Administration Certification uh, from the University of North Carolina, which I will just give a little shout out to for those who know that I went. Uh, so if you will uh, join me in welcoming Jim. Thank you very much, uh, Amber. Um, knowing that now that you've come from North Carolina, University of North Carolina, I'm sure you've been following the news about their coach. So, we'll see where we go from there. Uh, I'm going to come from a different perspective on that. I'm not a technical individual. I'm more of a manager, more in public administration and, and that sort. And when I got to the city of uh, Havelock, I, I've got to say that in my career that I really haven't dealt with um, the military in regards to the municipality or with the bases and things of that sort. So this has been a learning, I'm sorry, this has been a learning app, um, opportunity for me in regards to understand how things go and, and uh, learn the acronyms and the names and things of that sort. But I also heard that, I'm glad to have heard that, uh, as Amber said in the beginning of that, that some of these JLU's plans have sat on the shelf since 1995. Thank goodness we're not one of them, but we're pretty close to it. I think when we did our JLU's plan back in 2001 and AQ's plan back in 2002 and that, uh, it's taken a while to get to this point where we are today. And I'll, I'll tell you the end of the story as we get toward the end of the presentation. But Something you, you, we all got to keep in mind from the political structure on that thing that when we did the ACUS back in the 201, 202, and I wasn't part of that because I've only been in Havlock like about six years, I mean, there was a lot of enthusiasm. There was a lot of, a lot of support. The regions from Carteret County, Pamlico, uh, surrounding there, Newport, and the cities and that all contributed to this, and the base contributed to go ahead and do this plan. But what happens as we'll go through the presentation here on that, you see that that's kind of winds down when you actually try to get this thing implemented. Uh, starting off, uh, just to give you an idea where uh, Havelock, North Carolina is and MCS Cherry Point. We're on the eastern part of North Carolina by Moorhead City and that. Um, we're a population of approximately 22,000. Most of the base is incorporated inside our city limits. I mentioned about some of the definitions and acronyms and I think this is important in, in, in you all probably being from military families and uh, mil working with the military bases and things of that sort understand this stuff. But when you find that you're within a transient community and whereby your, your population changes every four to five years, even though a lot of that might be the military, that you find that you, you sometimes have the political powers and community people that come in and developers that come in that really don't understand this. And this really an educational program to understand what do you mean by an ACUS, what do you mean by an APZ and et cetera and that. The last one down there, I'm not going to read all this, I think is, is where we, in our strategy, we looked at going, which is called a Unified Development Ordinance. And I credit our staff from Scott Chase and that to come up with this kind of a strategy of how to get this stuff Im implemented. Um, origins, as I said before, we started back in 201, 202. Uh, we had two studies that were actually done at that time, a lot of participation, a lot of hoopla, let's get it going, and then things of that sort as with everybody else. These studies identified a number of deficiencies that we found in land use control, encroachment, ACUS, and et cetera. And they put the task together, not just for us, but also for the surrounding counties and cities to say, all right, here's the activities, here's where we need to go and that. Generally, there were a lot of more details in this, but I would just, just kind of summarize some of the things that they came up with. One of those, of course, the thing is that we really needed to modify our comprehensive plans. When you got to consider that the city of Havelock's original land use plan was done in 1970 and the last amendment was done in 1996 along with the zoning, I mean, it was kind of old. Um, and, and it didn't take into account of the base itself. And the subdivisions were the same way. The building codes were basically the same way and things of that sort. 
Other thing we had to consider on that thing, of course, we found that need to expand the land use controls to the incorporated areas. We call it in North Carolina, you have a, uh, uh, you can go up to a mile outside of your city and call ETJ, extraterritorial jurisdiction, in which we can have subdivision controls, planning controls, and things of that sort. Providing the county uh, isn't already out there, and they were not in this particular case. But we needed to identify those things or according to the, uh, uh, the studies in that, and we needed to do something about it to help protect the base itself. We also needed to do the uh, adopted noise attenuation. At that time, it was the F-18s. Um, we're going to come in, and that's something that we need to do. And once we did that, and that study was actually done, was also incorporating the building codes, not just the, the North Carolina State Building Code, but we're allowed through our local powers and that to also implement uh, higher standards, you might say, in terms of sound attenuation and decibels and, and construction and things of that sort. So that was also identified that we needed to do on that. We also needed to limit the expansion. Uh, once we identify where those uh, runways were and where the APZ, how do we do that? We, when you, when you talked about possibly limiting the infrastructure that might go there, your water and sewer, your zoning your possibility, your subdivision controls and that and not allowing a more dense development on that but maybe a, maybe a more sparse development and making it very difficult in terms of your water expansion into those areas and your sewer expansion in those areas. And of course, the last is, is the public awareness and I heard uh, from the earlier speaker they did something there that uh, we haven't done was in the communications uh, side. I think it, since that time, uh, we had gotten uh, with a developer or real estate people and actually put together a plan showing where the sound attenuation was. So it is a, a matter of information. When they go and sell a house or show a piece of property, they have a map and they have access to it to, to let the property owner who's ever going to buy that know up front what was going to happen. Those were some of the deficiencies. Of course, there were a lot more detail that went behind that. Of course, what was our challenge? All right, we all got off on a good start. This sounds very good. Let's help out Cherry Point. Now, each one, Carteret County, go ahead and this is what you need to do. Emerald Isle, this is what you need to do. City of Havelock, of course, with the MCS Cherry Point, here's what you needed, which was a whole lot of things uh, to, to go ahead and take on. So at that particular time, of course, the planning staff was assigned the responsibility to go ahead and look and update these information and that, and they got into it. But by 205 is when I came in on in, uh, into Havelock at that, we found that was seems to be a lack of luster, you might say. The, the, some of the people, uh, uh, stakeholders of that have changed hands. Um, if, you, if you're a planner, there's, there's the old way, I'm, I'm going back to the 70s and 80s when they were doing that, well, let's see, before you do your zoning and your this here, you need to do your land use plan. So we need to do the hackle this one first, and we need to do this one separately, and we needed to do this one. So that's what they were trying to do. But what happens out there in your community that people kind of kind of gets old sometimes, unless it affects them directly as a developer, and then he he wants to make sure that he has his input in onto that. So there was really a lackluster control in, in, in 205, in about March 205, at a planning retreat. We got talking about this. How can we get the, the, the stuff that the ACUS has mentioned that we needed? How can we get the, the APZ, everything, the building codes and things of that up to date? How do we get that implemented? How do we, how do we get this thing? And planning staff came up with an idea at that time and said, let's do a test case here. One, we needed to do the land use plan. I mean, that's the basics for everything. We didn't even think about UDOs at this particular time. And we need to do the transportation plan and with the, the, the concerns that we have with the transportation that. So we decided at that time to get the stakeholders. You hear that term always involved. We really didn't do it before. So let's do a comprehensive plan with those two tied together. Let's get the developers together. Let's get NCDOT together. Elected, uh, we, we included uh, MCS Cherry Point to be part of that process and that. So and the developers and the citizens and we had a big kickoff and everybody loved this so we got the enthusiasm back you might say to go ahead and do this and then all of a sudden you know I mean we even got DOT to actually contribute about ten thousand dollars toward this this uh, process to update all this and what had happened though politics as we call it kind of gotten away by 207 because I think some of my elected officials didn't agree with some of the plans that DOT wanted to uh, implement that was part of this comprehensive plan, this thing kind of died. <laughs> it just kind of said, well, we're not going to do it on that. So also during that particular time, and I see Tyler Harris from Cherry Point here, we had a very controversial project come up 
which is called a uh, Walgreens for us, that was going to be located in APZ1 zone. We also found because of the old regulations and how they did, how they would allow and, and consider the, uh, the, the, the zoning for that, that the commissioners were very much involved, and you might say the ordinance itself wasn't a use by right, it was more subjective. So that brought out the community and, of course, brought out the base and who and the developer. I mean, it was, it was a hot night, you know, and then we, we, planning staff comes back and says, guys, hey, we, we try to get the land use, we try to get the zoning, we wanted to get these things going, but it just isn't, it's not working. The, the, it, you know, we can't, we can't tell you what to do on this. So what happens if trying to get it implemented? So what happens from that standpoint? We, we finally, I think, the planning staff and that, Scott, they started recognizing, hey, maybe we have an opportunity here. Let's take what we lost here, which was we had the enthusiasm back with the stakeholders into this process. And let's go into, let's go into something called the UDO, Urban Development Ordinance, uh, Unified Development Ordinance. And, the, and their argument was this thing on the channel. It says, let's, let's tack them all. So we have all single regulations as we look into this into one legal ordinance document. Uh, it's going to be more objective. Let's get the subjectivity. After the, the, the Walgreens situation, what happened, the community, the politics on that, let's get that out of the process here. Let's make this thing more objective on this thing. Let's look in the very important thing in getting all this stuff implemented. Let's battle, let's handle one battle and not a whole bunch of battles like we were trying to do before. Let's put everything in, in the encroachments, the building, uh, the building heights, the sign over the signs were also uh, controversial, ordinance and things of that sort in the APZ. And so we felt that it would be easier from a political standpoint to go ahead and uh, uh, try to convince that process. Fortunately, the commissioners, our elected official, says go with it. We did that giving you a little bit of an outline of what happened with the planning process of that was, was ID the stakeholders, as you all know. We wanted to get all these people involved, not just so much the, the elected citizens and the planning board, but also, you know, DOT, uh, the, uh, Department of Transportation, the Coastal Land Trust, and the developers, which was very much important because they, 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 they were the biggest screamers in, involved. And the city departments, they wanted to say in the matter in that. So this, this stakeholder was involved uh, as, as you shown on this list here. Um, next thing we needed to do was really ass assist in the, in the possible how we were going to fund this dang thing, you know. And we were very fortunate this time. We got to give compliments to OEA and, and MCS Cherry Point because this became a, a kind of an expensive process in that. And, and you know, this at this time, the 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 crisis hasn't hit. As, as we're all in right now, the fiscal problems that we're having with our local government and state and federal. But it was still a pretty big tab for us to do this thing. So OEA helped us step in there, I think, through Cherry Point and that. And we had some other locals that helped uh, make some contribution to this thing. We got DOT back to the table again, even though we had kicked them out of the, off the, the, the elected officials, right, like, uh, off at, before. And we got some other participants in there, the North, North Carolina Coastal Land Trust that they saw an opportunity here to get involved with the comprehensive program and land use and so forth. We also decided, okay, at that particular time, and, and really, again, it's not me, I'm going to credit my planning department for coming up with this thing, is revisit the, what we had before. Let's revisit the land use. From a local political strategy standpoint, we separated those two things because we knew that they were going to be a problem to begin with. So we took the transportation portion out of that comprehensive plan and went forward with the land use plan on that thing. And we're going to, we're going to go after the transportation on an individual and hopefully we'll have that adopted fairly shortly on that. Um, as we got the stakeholders involved and brought them into these meetings and that and the developers and that things, they really had to identify. We also involved them in identifying what the thing, the components and the sections are. So really here, this is an outline. There's a lot more details on, uh, that go behind these on the environmental regulations, how we would, the subdivisions, the, uh, you know, if we had to appeal this thing and et cetera and et cetera. So they were part of that process. It's not an easy process. And then one important thing we thought at this particular time to help sell the program was actually get one of the elected officials. We call him a UDO liaison. In our commission, in, in that regard, that was Commissioner Danny Walsh, who was most 
who, who, who follow this thing uh, tremendously and, and does all his reading and does all his homework and things of that sort. So we got him on there to work with the planning and to work with the stakeholders and that. You know, sometimes as a manager, you don't want all your elected officials or elected on these, on these boards, but th this particular case, I think it worked out. Um, after that, you know, there were a number of board reviews, standard kind of things, and bef we did a lot of that before we actually had the public hearing. Uh, brought it back to the public. And another process that, had, that we did, and it took us six or seven months on this thing, was actually okay board, meaning the elected officials. We now have input from the developers. We have uh, input from the base. We have input. This is what we've come up with a draft. We had the legal input on this thing. Let's schedule in a workshop meeting. We did for a, a, a once a month, the board went in with the planning staff and that and individually reviewed those recommendations per section of that UDO. Yeah, uh, let me tell you, at first there was a lot of comments, you know, we don't need this, we need this set back here, et cetera, and et cetera. But after halfway through, I think they pretty well understood it. I mean, it was, it was a long educational process to get these people involved that are going to make the ultimate decision if we're going to do this or not and implement this thing. So we finally decided, the board had finally decided a couple months ago to have some public hearings on it. Um, and as we come to the end, I'm happy to say that as of the last, this Monday night, uh, we actually had the board adopt the whole UDO, the APZ, the whole nine yards. So we now have a legal document that's easier to use, we hope, with the developers, something to enforce. And so right now it's being incorporated into our co codification, our ordinances, and hopefully it will go on from there. And with that, I'll uh, step down. Thank you, Jim. Um, and, I, and I think it, it goes without saying that, you know, given, given that it has been almost a decade process, if you could help me with another round of applause for Jim and Havelock for getting that done, I think those types of successes aren't normally recognized. And particularly when we get together as a group like this, I, I think we should take the time to recognize those a little bit more often. So. Thank you. And, you know, in, in addition to working with the, the local politicians, I think as you've heard all the speakers uh, discuss over the last week, you also have to incorporate stakeholders. Uh, you, you know, your, your local developers, uh, local educators, and, and most often when you're talking about land use control, the actual landowners. And I think sometimes, particularly in, in communities where there's a strong feeling about property rights. When you start talking about these types of land use controls, more zoning, uh, the, the, the comments you may hear back, you know, could be anything from, you know, you're not touching my land, to if I lose the development potential, what happens, and I can't sell my farm, what happens to my children? What happens to the potential for their f uh, financial security? Uh, Thankfully, uh, you know, we, we have Ginny Kozak here today to talk about what the folks down uh, around um, Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort have undertaken. Uh, they are in the final stages of developing a transfer of development rights program, which will not only, when fully implemented, uh, ensure the preservation of land and compatible development around the base, but also will serve as a uh, market-based mechanism for reimbursing landowners who may lose some development development potential. Uh, Ginny is the planning director of the Low Country Council of Governments and also a regional transportation and transit planner as well as an economist and statistician. An adjunct business professor, she teaches finance, economics, marketing, operations management, uh, strategy for Webster and Park Universities. She's been a management consultant, business journalist, historic home renovator, realtor and project manager. She's earned a BA from Vassar College, an MS from the University of Toronto, and an MBA from Queen University. Uh, please help me welcome Ginny.
and I'm also a certified yoga instructor. So maybe we'll, <laughs> we'll skip this presentation and do yoga. But um, as Amber uh, brought up, uh, many areas, uh, probably most areas of the country, there's a strong feeling that property rights are important. And yesterday, um, Mr. Rand Wentworth, one of the speakers in the morning, was talking about um, something about how people remember. And all I could think was if he hasn't worked in South Carolina, he doesn't know about people remembering. In Beaufort, when people talk about the war, these are longtime residents, they're talking about the war that started in South Carolina in 1861. <laughs> and they mean it. And this, and this sort of remembrance cuts across racial and ethnic and economic lines. People remember. And this is important as we go into this. Um, there's also a sort of char characteristic of people in South Carolina in 1861, after the st state seceded, and as you probably remember from American history classes, South Carolina was the first state to secede. The secession ordinance was in fact written in Beaufort, South Carolina. But a prominent Charleston lawyer who was a member of an old family uh, at the secession said about South Carolina that it was too small for a republic and too large for a lunatic asylum. <laughs> and he went on record with that. So you combine that with long memories and we had some interesting times during the early days in our public participation uh, activities. One of the reasons LCOG, as we're called, the Low Country Council of Governments, uh, became involved in this project, and as we do in many projects, is because somebody described us as sort of the, the Switzerland of agencies. We're neutral, but we're, you know, we have some technical competence, so it works pretty well. Now, regarding MCAS Buford, have any, has anybody seen the movie The Great Santini? Then you've seen MCAS Buford because the movie was made there and in downtown Beaufort. And some things on the air station have only recently been changed, uh, like the officer's club bar. <laughs> Anyhow, moving, moving on. Okay, so we started out with the J-Loose plan. It began um, in 1999. But as we were going with, uh, just to give you a brief overview of what the TDR program is, and then we'll go back into the history. But this was an added protection against encroachment for the air station. Now I know another speaker yesterday morning said we shouldn't be using the word encroachment anymore because it's not a very sort of friendly term. But nevertheless, it is encroachment. We're also, as Amber said, looking for some potential con uh, compensation for some landowners affected by ACUs, the overlay zone. Now, there is a program, there has been a program that's been very successfully applied, and this is the buying of easements, and Alice Howard is here with Russell Bird, and the two of them are in the community planning and liaison office at the air station, and have effectively, and I'll tell you how effective it's been, there was a gentleman whose family uh, were among the biggest farmers in Beaufort County, truck farmers in the 1920s and 30s, and this man felt that his property, because he inherited all this farmland, would be more valuable if the air station closed. And at any public meeting, um, since I've been in Beaufort, which is about 20 years, he would stand up and give the same speech about closing the air station. And oddly enough, he hasn't been heard from in a long time because he managed to have a nice deal on some conservation easements on his property. So he is now not talking about closing the air station in public. Anyhow, so throughout this process, we had a three-pronged community involvement, property owners, elected officials and the vice chairman of the county council, Paul Somerville, is sitting right in front here. And also uh, we had a public private sector uh, technical committee. One of the members is a lawyer who, um, we also did invite local developers, but since we have one lawyer who represents most of them, having him there has been adequate. He speaks for many. Okay. Uh, as everybody who has been speaking uh, in this stream uh, has been talking about, there's been multiple jurisdictions. 
And in this case, we had uh, Buford County, the city of Buford, and the town of Port Royal. And they have their own comprehensive plans, which unlike some other areas, they have been updating regularly and are really quite modern. We also were looking at the TDR program as a possible incentive or reward for developers. Right now, like in most areas of the country, there isn't much of a market for any kind of real estate development. Uh, but should that time come that, you know, the market improves, we want to make sure that developers feel this is an incentive. And by getting going, and I'll explain how that we're setting up a TDR bank, um, we'll be able to start buying development rights. And we've been fortunate enough to get some money for that. But anyhow, we began in October. This is before I was uh, at Elcog. In fact, I was being a planning dropout for about almost 20 years. Planning was just so much fun, I had to leave it uh, and do other things for a while, <laughs> seriously. Uh, so I decided to go back into planning in 2001, just in time for the uh, JLUS plan to be become sort of active. And uh, I was just thinking back, uh, since that time, we've had five commanding officers at the air station, and we're on our fifth. Fortunately, though, we have the, again, the uh, community planning and liaison office, and they are a stable force. So that makes it, uh, we do have continuity. Because sometimes I've spoken to uh, my counterparts in Georgia, in the Savannah area, about the base that they work there, were there, and every time the, C, uh, the commanding officer changes, everything changes in everything they're doing. So anyhow, the plan was completed in August 2004, and the three jurisdictions adopted it by resolution unanimously in September and October of 2004. Now, they were not really in favor of the JLUS plan, let me tell you, but there was this process coming up in 2005, BRAC, and they wanted to give at least the appearance of working on preventing encroachment around the air station. Now, the ACUS approval, the actually getting a zoning ordinance, because as you know, just saying you approve of a plan is a really nice thing to do and say, but it doesn't accomplish that much legally. Getting the overlay zoning for the land was a whole different issue. Uh, and there was a lot of unhappiness with it because people felt they were losing their development rights. And through the JLUS process, people also remembered that the United States government had apparently, I have no, I really don't, I, I was just a really young child during that period, and I wasn't living in South Carolina, um, that some land was taken without compensation. And I was blamed for that at one particular public meeting that hun literally 135 people attended, and it was my fault. But anyhow, be that as that may, moved on from there. Uh, and there were some compromises needed to get this zo the zoning ordinance. And again, this was a definitely a group, a team effort, including the commanding officer personally. The commanding officer at the air station then uh, was really directly involved, spoke at a meeting, at a public meeting, did, dealt with individuals and so on. And one of the issues was a matter of could people be compensated? Well, there wasn't enough cash available. And some of the properties are, you know, only a, a couple of acres. And that's, you know, doesn't really work too well with the conservation easement approach. At the same time, the area that was most affected, both in uh, AP's uh, accident potential zones and noise somewhat, but especially accident potential zones, had 13 churches in it. These were mostly small African American churches. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, this memory cuts across, you know, crosses all sorts of, you know, racial and ethnic lines. And the concern was that some of these churches were worried that you may remember in the history of the United States in the 50s and 60s, but even up into this century, sometimes black churches are burned and they wanted to be able to be able to rebuild and possibly to actually add washrooms to their churches. So there had to be some negotiation, not that no new development, et cetera, but the additional development. We also have a concept in the low country of South Carolina called family compounds, where if families have owned the land for usually 50 years or more, they are exempt from certain zoning laws. 
so we had to put them into it. And this was a lot of work. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was involved, uh, the commanding officer of the air station, the community planning liaison officer, and fortunately, Beaufort County's uh, director of buildings at the time was also, as a, in his spare time, was a minister at one of the churches. And so he was able to kind of rally his peers among uh, the pastors, and so that helped quite a bit. It also helped, uh, you know, just to have everybody really started getting on board. Okay, then with the help of OEA. Now, actually, there was sort of a chicken and egg situation here. The thought, the concept for a TDR program had been introduced actually by the president of the Chamber of Commerce in 2005, and we knew we were going to have to do, you know, have some technical work done on setting up a program, and OEA was certainly interested in supporting this, but they said they would not support uh, the program financially unless we had the zoning ordinance, but to get the zoning ordinance we needed a TDR program, but again, every people in the community were willing to wait. So we started, there was a com, uh, consultant study done uh, by a group out of Annapolis, Maryland, and that started in the fall of 2007, and there were 3,295 parcels in what was called the sending area, basically the ACU zone but only 485 parcels, or 939 acres, were candidates for the TDR program. Then we eventually got down to 858 potential TDRs, which would have translated if we are using, for every TDR uh, a developer would get, every TDR purchased, a developer would get three additional residential units, would add 2,574 additional residential units to the area. Now during this period, Beaufort County was the fastest growing county in the state of South Carolina. It was growing really fast and Beaufort County was actually enjoying its first prosperity really since 1861 when Beaufort County was the richest county in the state of South Carolina. So there was this feeling that uh, just let things go on and you know, we hadn't had any good, good fortune in a long time Let's let development continue. A lot of retirees were moving in. And oddly enough, retirees, even though they had come from all over the country, the Middle West, Cleveland, etc., they started adopting some of the same attitudes toward property and not wanting to be bothered that people who had lived there, or at least their families had lived there for hundreds of years. It's interesting. That sort of thing just kind of is contagious, I guess. Okay, now you have in front of you, this is the ACU zone. And this became then the sending area. This was when the first consultants worked on this. Now the receiving area for any transfer development rights program is a little harder to uh, define. At the time though, uh, there was something called the Northern Beaufort County Regional Growth Area being defined through a study. And so that was chosen as the receiving area. And that was later modified because of people wanting something. Now, one of the things we also wanted to make sure, though, in the receiving areas, that it would be good development. We weren't going to promote sprawl. You know, we were starting to recognize things even in Beaufort County, like, you know, smart growth and uh, new urbanism and so on. And so this was important that the, any new development, even if, it was in, if the developer got incentive to build more units, he or she was still going to have to meet all the good building and development requirements for the area. And again, the planning commissions wanted to ensure, this was the planning commissions of all three jurisdictions, that the TDR program would be, bring value to the area and its residents and only increase density where it was appropriate. And at the same time, we get back to the whole fact that we could not use TDRs to promote unsound development. And that was a concern a lot of people, you know, who liked the idea of TDR in principle, but wanted to make sure that it worked properly. Uh, now we're moving into the implementation of uh, the program. 
And the first thing that happened to us, it was in January 2009, we received a quarter million dollars from the state of South Carolina as seed money for a TDR bank. We haven't spent it yet. It's in our bank account at LCOG. And every so often the state rattles around making noises about how in these times of money they would like this back. But since they'll have to be over my dead body, uh, <laughs> so we'll see what happens. Read the obituaries. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and then in fall, the fall of 2009, with OEA's major assistance again, we hired other consultants to be get, begin a detailed implementation and management plan because the first study we had done was, is it feasible basically and what would it consist of? Meanwhile, since we had done the original study in 2007 or was completed during that time, the market uh, had definitely changed. And at that time we weren't including really small parcels so we added them back in. And receiving areas were limited to locations in Beaufort County only that were slated for growth with the city and town, so we changed the sending, well the sending area is still the same. Well actually no, that's a lie. The sending area, if, if I put the overlay of the original map on here, is somewhat smaller. Because as you know, we'll be getting a different kind of jet. We're getting the F-35 or Joint Strike Fighter. And that uh, will have a different noise pattern. And so at the time that the study was being done, uh, Obviously, they still haven't completed the ACUs. There was no assurance exactly, you know, what the noise contours would be. But with Amber's advice, we decided to add a buffer that would probably incorporate most, you know, expansions to the noise. So the sending area has increased in size to accommodate the F-35, probably close to 100 percent. Also, one of my graduate students is the guy who's uh, retired uh, XO from the air station who was keeping me informed about things like this. He got A's in the course. Actually, he's taken three courses with me, so. No, he was, he's an A student anyhow. He would have gotten an A. Okay, oops. Yeah. And we're working on a management structure, and the first thing is that, um, Beaufort County is going to take on the regulatory and administrative role. And there will be an, a bank established with that $250,000 and there's going to be some repi money that will be a similar amount, which we're very fortunate and we're also getting some administrative uh, assistance money from OEA. And interestingly, when we were first going through this exercise of looking at TDR, uh, the elected officials were just death on the thought of a bank. For some reason that just really, but times have changed and now that seems to be acceptable. And here we are, six weeks ago, Beaufort County on its third reading passed a TDR, the TDR ordinance that is needed to set up the program and resolutions of support were provided by the city of Beaufort and the town of Port Royal. They uh, will not be part of the original program because not too much of the land was in the send, almost nothing in the sending area. And uh, the receiving area will be expanded later to really include uh, the town and the city. And we have a task force, which is really our technical committee, working on setting up a recommended management structure. And what is really interesting is, you know, we hear the word stakeholder a lot. And I was just thinking yesterday, listening to presentations about stakeholders, that I don't even think of our, either the elected officials or our technical body anymore as stakeholders. I just think of us as part of a team that works together to try and accomplish something. And that I think is a real, uh, for the long term, not, not just the, of the JLUS plan being implemented or the TDR program being implemented, but it says, you know, it gives us a lot to look forward to and as a team, we've moved beyond these projects and working together, most of the same people and a few additions to the team, we got a bus livability grant that will include public transit to the air station, also to Paris Island. But um, one of the reasons we got it apparently was because we had such, we had, we had a track record as a team. 
And we're also, you know, working on other things. I was just looking into another grant, transportation grant with the VA for local, uh, both military and retired military. So anyhow, I think our experience has been not only that working with partners, stakeholders, whatever you want to call us, um, has, had, has made this project work, this program work, and I think we'll get it implemented. But at the same time, I think it really has a lot of long-term positive implications for anything, to get anything done within our area. So thank you. You did not see that. The chair did not fall off the stage. Um, I'll ask our other speakers to um, come up. And um, before we start the uh, question and answer portion, I've been asked to make an announcement, um, hopefully which those of you staying until tomorrow will be happy about. Workshops begin at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, not 7. So again, don't show up at 7. Nobody else will be there. So, you know, I, I have to say that I've, you know, truly not only enjoyed working with uh, the, the folks that are up here on the stage, but have had an opportunity to um, learn from them as well. And, you know, while I don't work directly with uh, David and uh, uh, the, the folks up in New Jersey, one of my communities who was facing uh, communications problems around their base has actually used their communication model and process. Uh, as a basis for their their work and, and they're beginning to move forward with that framework now. Uh, yesterday we heard uh, TDRs as a potential recommendation for other joint land use studies discussed. So I think the great thing about these types of conferences is not only do you, um, you know, hopefully get a chance to hear about what else is going on and the, the big picture, but you really get a chance to uh, learn from one another. Uh, you know, as we begin the um, question and answer portion, I'm going to ask you to come up to the um, microphone so that we can all hear the uh, questions, and it is being recorded. Um, so do we, do we have any questions? I, I have to, you know, would assume that many people are facing the same problems the folks up here have as you all begin your implementation process. Questions? Questions? This is for this is for Mr. Kozak. Um, the county I work in has a TDR program as well, but it has not been successful at all. Have you seen success already, or have you? I see that you've just adopted it. Have you? Do you do you see progress in the future? And also, my question uh, it's two parts. Um, unfortunately, I think the reason we haven't seen any progress is because our receiving sites already have such a high density that developers really they have a trouble putting enough uh, units on that land already so to give them more rights it's really not helping them that's the issue we're having I didn't know if you have a, any issues with that or, or have you chosen receiving sites that specifically have low densities thus uh, you know incentivizing these people to try and use them okay the, um, I think at this point there it, there would be no activity we're gearing up um, and we are intending to use the half million dollars that we have or most of it to actually purchase development rights to sort of, sort of jumpstart the market, to let people who want to sell, and of course we're making this very you know, clear that this is a voluntary program. So if anybody wants to sell, we will be in a position uh, through the mechanisms that are being set up now to buy TDRs and put them in a bank and hopefully sell them. And the areas that are, have been chosen as the receiving areas basically don't have any development in them now, but are slated, and they have services, they have sewer and water, so that's not an issue. We have a you know, really good regional service program. In fact, they serve the three military uh, facilities as well. Um, and they're also, they include some planned unit development districts whose uh, sunsets have come. They're going to have to be renegotiated if anybody, if the developers or the owners want to build on them. So it's kind of an opportune time. And of course, this will all depend on the real estate market, which I don't think anybody can predict right this minute. 
sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andrew Demas. I am a city planner with Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, my question is to Mr. Freeman. Uh, I can definitely empathize. The city of Corpus just went through our UDC process and uh, luckily just uh, as you did we went live July the 1st. Uh, my question is what type of challenges did you face and how did you mitigate them when it came to owner initiated platting and change of zoning requests in ACUS areas? Wow. Believe it or not, when we had them, we had them at the table with, with our, our planning director and that, the people that were really more concerned with those changes that happened in the ACUS, in, in the APZs area, those were the people, some of the, the developers in the community. Each community has its little power structure on that. So it's a lot of that discussion took place along those bases on that. There was also a behind the scenes probably a lot of discussion one-on-one -on -one with people, and I think we were very open to those kind of concerns that we had and could we compromise of course if we had to compromise in that we behind the scenes again probably had to talk you know make sure that cherry point was aboard in terms of maybe the footprint of it or or, or things of that sort so you know it wasn't it wasn't a process that you might say that should have been done out in the open kind of thing but it was more successful process of, of when i said we wanted to all bring it in this case we wanted to all split it out in terms of the strategy and have the strategy being from a one-on-one -on -one basis, let's meet with them, let's talk, and let's see where we can go from that standpoint. Thank you. Uh, one of the, the, um, yeah. the, the things that I enjoy about each of your stories is that the, 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 the various strategies that you all take not only meet the mission of the base and, in, and ensuring compatible use, but also meet numerous needs and uh, uh, priorities of the community. I'm hoping that each of you might address um, how you use the joint land use process as a way to ensure either economic vitality, ensure community character, um, at, you know, really using it as a way, again, not only to meet the, the mission of the base, and how you use that message to move the process forward. Yeah, as I had sort of stated during my presentation, the, the, the consolidation of the three bases in the one and the joint land use process um, really not only got us talking to the base um, in a better way, it got us talking to each other um, more frequently and learning from each other. Um, one of the, the, the big impacts on my particular office uh, was working more closely with Burlington County, which we, we had not done before, um, but we basically agreed to partner on this effort. We share a lot of um, similar regional issues, um, but again, we just really never communicated with each other. And, and learning from uh, some of their towns in Burlington County and trying to um, look at some of the solutions or some of the, the issues there and, and put them on some of the Ocean County towns I thought was very beneficial. Um, but, but mainly, I guess, to look more regionally, uh, not just um, at the one community by one community, but looking at the joint base, looking at the, the huge potential um, economic impact, as you mentioned, um, and the opportunities there, and being able to um, plan towards that, more long-range planning than, than immediate, the, the immediate um, issues we've been working on is preventing encroachments and, and trying to assure consistency. But that, that whole economic development component is on the table now and is something we're working towards um, in a, in a long-range sense. You know, taking off a little, a little bit what David said, what this process did of using OEA and going through this, and this learning process that we did was help, and we use the term all the time, developing partnerships and, and collaboration. But what that process also helped us to do was be able to be able to build upon that, whereby getting a lot of our developers. And let me, let me I'm not against development by any means, but but we have some developers that come and see us, and they're really and yeah, we want the base. We, we we think it's important so they can build homes and build their apartments and don't care about the encroachment, and then they're gone. 
on that. But it allowed us to, I think, with them at the table and talking with them to understand the importance of the base and the economic impact that that base has on our community, and not just on our community, and the surrounding communities that we had with us. And I think with that discussion and dialogue that we had, all of a sudden kind of opened up some other doors in that and made things process a little bit easier. What also made things process easier is the ability to bring in some other agencies, such as CAMA, down there, which helped us, uh, and I didn't mention on that, helped us pay for part of the stuff like, an, well, you know, we will, we'll give you some money here in regard to, I think it was only about 20-some thousand dollars of that 37 contribution on that because we're concerned on some of the encroachments that the base has and, and we want to make sure that that land use or that zoning that we're going to implement in those areas will protect that thing. So, so that kind of opened up, I think that process opened up the eyes and opened up the, the doors that we were not, we didn't have before. Okay, well, definitely in our area, um, the importance not just of the air station, but Paris Island, the Marine Recruit Depot, and the Naval Hospital are really important in terms of jobs because although the biggest employer um, is the school district, as is the situation in most cases, um, another major employer in our area is tourism. That's a very major employer. But tourism jobs don't pay well. Another major employer is Walmart. Um, these are in the top five employers. People started realizing during the course of this that the good jobs are being generated either at or by the air station. And that was a realization that a lot of people didn't have. And that if the air station were to close, it would be very difficult to replace not just the jobs on the air station, but the spin-off jobs that have been created over the years. And that there's, poten uh, there's all potential for more employment, more economic development. At the same time, um, I was talking about that major community near the air station um, that was very concerned about their churches, about their existing buildings. The families had been there in many cases well over 100 years. It was, it's largely an African-American area. And this made their concerns very apparent to the wider community in a way that they had never been. That also was very important. Um, there were a number of other things that came out, and this served as a sort of community education process. We also learned, and that included some, some of the professional planners, myself and, and others, of how well we were already protected by our, zone, uh, by our building codes, because we have the Southeastern Building Code that as a result of Hurricane Andrew, the insurance industry of the United States insisted be really tightened up. So we didn't have quite as many, it wasn't going to be as expensive to add the noise abatement. So it was a mutual learning process, I think, and that was, that was really important. And I think everybody involved, whether they were members of the community who frankly wanted the air station to close so it would be quiet where they live. We had a group of those people, too, who wanted to get a good night's sleep for a change. And but they, they, even they realized that their property wouldn't be worth as much. And th that they might get a good night's sleep, but that might be all that they were doing, is, is getting a good night's sleep. <laughs> so I think it, it was a very good mutual learning and learning about what was important to the community in terms of both the economy and in terms of what people's values were. And as I say, we also developed out of it uh, we have gotten into uh, much more favorable attitudes toward public transit. So that was another nice spinoff. Thank you. Sir? Yeah, Paul Somerville, Beaufort County. I uh, work with uh, the TDR program as an elected official. I want to make a comment. Jenny added that, uh, that we're using $500,000 in seed money to kind of kickstart the program. Uh, but some, I, I don't remember who it was. Somebody mentioned they had a TB, TDR program and it hasn't worked very well. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you from? <coughs> Where? Florida. Florida. Uh, one of the things that we did on the elected official side before we voted this in, before we voted, uh, we passed the TDR program, was we looked around at, uh, at, at some large landowners who had been coming to us asking us to upzone specific pieces of pro large specific pieces of property, and we said no knowing full well that we were going to implement a TDR program. And what we told them was, look, you can upzone it yourself through the TDR program if you'll just let us implement it. So we kind of 
stack the deck a little bit in that regard. Now, how well it's going to work out remains to be seen, mm -hmm. but we did a lot of behind-the-scenes work to kind of set this thing up so that we, we think we have a captive market when it, when it comes on board. Thank you. Could I just add one, one little thing? And, you know, Paul is hinting at this. My colleague Jim is hinting at this. But a lot of the communications and negotiations are not the ones that take place in front of, you know, public hearing at community council or a public meeting. It's the discussions of smaller groups of people. Uh, I don't want to say behind the scenes, but I'd call them informal communications that actually are the things, and that was certainly true of the commanding officer of the air station going out and talking to the pastors of the churches and so on. Um, and this is how decisions, I think, really get made, good decisions. If you try and keep it all on the formal level, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it might not happen. Sir? Hi, I'm Ed Fox uh, from Burlington County, New Jersey. We're with David McKeon. Uh, one of the things that we had, and maybe Dave can expand upon this, maybe the other two presenters can talk about this a little bit. Maybe we can talk about this in the session after this. With compatible uses, after September 11th, um, something happened on our base that probably happened everywhere else. You can't drive through the base anymore. People don't come on and off the base anymore. There aren't any taxi cabs that go on and off the base anymore. People don't go out for lunch anymore because it takes too long to get back in. Part of that was also enhanced by the base started putting all its restaurants, retail operations, service uses on base that the service members were actually going off base to use. They were sort of making their own little island. And part of our compatible use was talking with the base to see why are you taking our tax rateables away? Why are you building your restaurants and fast food places on base when they really are just across the street? You know, part of that compatible use zoning was talking with them and saying, we're part of the community. Don't take these important things away because after you take them away, the restaurants and the place you get your hair cut and the place you buy your newspapers and that sort of thing, our towns don't have a reason to exist. So, Mark Dave, if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe the other two uh, presenters too. Well, I, I think you framed that very well. I mean, that was a concern um, and uh, it originated really on the, on the Burlington side because they, Wrightstown Borough is right outside the main gate of McGuire and they, they were experiencing that, that problem with, with development on the base. Um, and that was, you know, that was one of the big issues that we talked to the base about and it took, and it took a while and, you know, we're not there to, we've got full agreement, but I think we have a better understanding of the issues. Um, that was some of the frustrations express, expressed by the mayor. Uh, the route that was through the base that connected two towns that was closed, that was another major issue that was, was discussed. And the base uh, appropriately, you know, cited security concerns and the needs to get to, to be more, much more restrictive than things had been, but that they were willing to look at these issues over time and, and phase in solutions. And I think we, we do have a level of trust that, that that is happening, that will happen. Um, not all of the issues have been resolved, but uh, again, that is something that was able to, to, to come out through this process and is able to continue toward, towards, a, towards a solution. Yeah, when, when I got there in the Havoc in 205, I think this was a concern. In fact, it, when I first got there, the commanding officer of the base, and I won't name his name at that time, actually had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, again, behind the doors, you might say, and was really concerned about the city's recruitment in terms of, at that particular time, was a super Walmart bringing in and what it would do to the impact of the base that they, uh, from the exchange and some of the things that they'd done, and, and they were just basically saying that we, we, we can't support kind of this, you know, you're com uh, we just not going to work with you, you might say, in that. So, but I think you know that was a hard that was a hard hurdle that was before us. But again, I go back to that. I think we started building partnerships and, and uh, discussions with them, and even through the OEA by 207. That when we started going back, I referred back to my presentation, part of the establishment, getting that trust back, and that that concern isn't there anymore. Um, no, we can't drive through our base also on there, but we also have outside the base uh, perimeter, we ha also have some property in which the base is privatized. And that's been an interesting situation that we've worked through an MOU with them for compatible uh, building code and stuff of that sort that maybe, you know, 
can we work these things out together in terms of construction, construction of those homes and things of that sort. So we were able to work through the process at least off the base on that, then we could go through on the base. But that, that, that working relation had, had to be developed. Okay, uh, to my knowledge, now maybe Alice or Paul have heard different situations, but that really was, has not been too much of an issue in our area because oddly enough, uh, all three of our facilities, but especially uh, Paris Island and the air station, there isn't anything right outside, much right outside the gates. And especially there wasn't 10, 20 years ago. Um, in fact, it, it kind of surprised me when I moved to Beaufort that there wasn't the sort of traditional uh, tattoo parlors and strip joints <laughs> and so on right outside the base. I thought, what's the matter here? What's, yeah. but, and the fast food restaurants are some distance away. And as you also may be aware, the Marine Corps has very strict rules about going, if, if it's a uh, fatigue day, you don't go out in public and you're only on the air station. Uh, so they have very strict dress rules for going off the facility. So it, uh, it really hasn't been the kind of issue. Um, and also, our, our installations are pretty small. Even though Paris Island, a lot of people go through, the recruits aren't exactly buying lunch for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, and restaurants somehow never really last, uh, make it at the air station. So we haven't had the same. And Super Walmart is patronized heavily by the military. If the Super Walmart closed, I think there'd be a major problem. Well, if there are no final questions, if you could help me thank our speakers. And again, I greatly appreciate your attention and time. Uh, we'll be up here for a couple minutes if any of you have any final questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the draft is online. Okay. I'm sure once it's codified, it's going to be online. Okay. If you like it, you got a card? Yes. I can get our planning director for your copy of the thing, the finalization of it. Is that what you've done?